welcome everyone to a special Friday edition of University Hour. Uh, I'm Dr. Chuck Booth from the Biology Department. And before I introduce our distinguished guest, I would just like to say that immediately following the talk, there'll be an informal reception across the hall in 219 with refreshments, uh, coffee and punch and uh, some hors d'oeuvres. Uh, the book that Dr. Uh, Plotter will be talking about is on sale over here. And if you have a copy or buy a copy, I'm sure he'd be happy to sign it for you. Uh, uh, Zygmunt Plotter uh, grew up in Pennsylvania. He's uh, originally Polish. Uh, he received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton, his uh, doctor or uh, JD uh, law degree from Yale, and later earned two uh, other law degrees from the University of Michigan. He's taught on seven law faculties, uh, including the University of Tennessee, uh, which is where today's talk will begin. Uh, he, where I was fired. Yeah, he's taught in seven law faculties, fired from only one. Uh, he spent three years teaching public law at the National University of Ethiopia, where he re helped redraft laws protecting parks and refuges, uh, assisted in publication of the Consolidated Laws of Ethiopia, and helped organize the first United Nations Conference on Individual Rights in Africa. Uh, for the past 35 years, he's taught uh, in the School of Law at Boston College, where he teaches and conducts research in areas of environmental uh, property law, land use, and uh, uh, administrative agency law. He has become one of the nation's foremost authorities on environmental issues and environmental law. Uh, the story will begin at the University of Tennessee where he, I guess, fulfilled every lawyer's fantasy of arguing and winning a Supreme Court case. Uh, after that, he, uh, 1989, after the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska, he was picked to be chairman of the state of Alaska's Oil Spill Commission's Legal Task Force. Uh, he's been a consultant uh, for a number of high-profile cases, including the infamous uh, Woburn, Massachusetts toxic chemical waste uh, that uh, was the subject of a book and movie, uh, A Civil Action. Uh, he consulted uh, on the legal issues of the 2010 uh, British Petroleum Deepwater Horizon uh, oil well uh, disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, he came to my attention as the author of a 2013 book uh, talking about the, his Supreme Court case, uh, the book The Snail Darter and the Dam, How Port Barrel Politics Endangered a Little Fish and Killed a River, uh, gives his account of the events leading up to and after the uh, uh, Supreme Court case. So he's going to talk about the snail darter and the court case and some of the lessons that are relevant to today's politics and environmental regulations. So I hope you'll join with me in wishing uh, him welcome to Eastern Connecticut State University. Thank you very much, Chuck. I've never been here before. It is an amazing looking place. Really, thank you so much for bringing me here. Uh, can you hear in back? Yeah. Lisa, is it all right? Good. Um, I mean, my students and I had the honor and the peril of having this case fall in our laps. I like to do things with my students. And it's become a parable. I mean, it was 40 years ago. Uh, but like many parables, uh, it might get clearer over time. Uh, and what's the first law of ecology? Chuck, you did? Oh, in back, your name is? Uh, Matt. Matt? Matt? Yeah. It's Matt. Everything's Everything is connected to everything else. Uh, and so we're talking about a little fish. But as you'll see, and as Walter found when he went through the book, there's biology, there's economics, there's politics, there's philosophy, uh, and there's media, and, and, uh, and, and politics. The people who, I mean, it still is a caricature of stupidity, of environmental extremism, a bunch of people blocking a gigantic hydroelectric dam for a stupid little fish. We were called, uh, Sean Hannity, fringe, this is in the last few years, by the way, and it, it, it's still day by day, week by week, it's, it's remembered as fringe lunacy, or Ann Coulter, uh, anti-biblical, anti-Torah, anti-Christian, I didn't feel that at the time, but, uh, or, or Rush Lim, oh, oh um, the snail darter is used by right wing against government regulation, a, a sign of stupidity of, of government regulation, or Rush, I, I don't know what it means, but I think it was pejorative when he called us homosocialists. 
Uh, but so you see, the politics of it is still alive, and the story is remembered uh, in, in a way that you will see quite differently from, from eco-extremism. Um, so yes, we're focusing on the little fish, but, but there's going to be a, a lot that you might want to make. And stick up your hands and ask questions in the middle if, if you want, or we can carry questions afterwards. Everything starts with a place. This is the place. This is the habitat. This is the little Tennessee River. About 17 miles behind us are the Smokies. Anybody here visit the Smokies? Yeah, so I mean 10 million people a year. Uh, and, and beautiful mountains, but as you can see, this isn't mountainous. And another 13 miles down uh, is the big Tennessee River. Uh, it's, the little Tennessee was spectacular. The uh, Indians, the Cherokee, call the Smokies the enemy mountains. And you can see the river coming through the Smokies and then down past Chota, which was the Jerusalem of the Cherokees, Tanafi, Tennessee town, which gave its name to the river and, and to the Tennessee Valley Authority, coming down. If you see Fort Loudoun, uh, I think I can go, that Fort Loudoun was built in 1752 by the uh, English and the Cherokee against the French and the Iroquois. Uh, and it was rebuilt a bit, but you see on this 1762 map, you can see the fort down there and Tuskegee, the little town where Sequoia, the great Cherokee leader, was born. An incredibly historic place, but not just for the Cherokee. If you see the island there below Fort Loudoun, um, the archaeologists found the oldest continuous human habitation in the United States, 10,000 years of continuous human habitation. Uh, the Russell Cave National Monument has it, but it's just a shelter. An amazing place. Uh, trout fishermen, how many of you know? Oh, good. It's an intimate way of relating yourself to everything else. Uh, big, better, the best river I've fished east of, of Montana uh, because it has a lot of lime in it. Why is that good? The limestone base of the Smokies, Cades Cove, if you went there, comes into the little river. Is that good or bad? Is that acid or alkali? Limestone, chalk. Pardon? It's alkali. Is that good or bad? In moderation. In moderation, it's very good because you, it, 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 you get a tremendous biodiversity. And the soil, I grew up plowing rocks in the Appalachians, 15 feet of USDA uh, one and two land, just an amazing place. Uh, and, and TVA wanted to build that dam and build it in 1968. Uh, but it was just standing there alone, uh, not blocking uh, the main river because it was off on a side channel. Uh, this is where the little Tennessee uh, had a habitat for uh, a little snail darter, but nobody knew it at the time. This is the problem. Tennessee clearly did not have enough dams. It, they, they had done a list in 1936, and 69 of them, 68 were built, so this was the last place left. And Red Wagner was the dictator of the Tennessee Valley Authority. He said, I have never lost a case to citizen objections. I have this on the list. We must build it. And it was an obsession with him. We can talk a little bit more uh, about that. Uh, and he called his people together. Uh, oh, oh, this is the dam that people think about. Uh, this is the actual dam. Do you see? It, it, it's, 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 it's tiny. Uh, but he said, we cannot justify it for uh, hydroelectric. There are no generators on it. We can't justify for flood control, for water supply, for any of the things you normally would think. Uh, so he invited his staffers to a meeting on uh, Friday the 13th of, of uh, September 1959 and said, come with your imagination. All right, do, do you see the black line? That's not the river. That's the lake he wants to build. But in order to build it, they said, let us condemn three times as much land. We'll take it from the farmers, 300 family farms. We'll condemn it for about $330 an acre. And then Boeing is going to come in and create an industrial city called Timberlake, named after the guy who did that map in 1762, by the way. I mean, it's crazy. And Boeing pulled out. They said, this isn't going to work. But the farmland still was being condemned for uh, an imaginary city 
which would, and TBA said, 50,000 people will live there, 26,000 jobs. If you environmentalists care about real people, you'll let the jobs come, and, and you know the, that kind of song and dance. But everyone knew it was a crock of spin. Uh, the, these are two of the farmers. Uh, uh, this is Asa and Nellie McCall. Their farm is 99 acres. Uh, and, and only two acres down by the river would, would be flooded. They said, please, we'll give you those. Let us keep uh, the rest of our farm. And the TVA guys said, no, we have to say we're building a model city. She said, but Boeing's pulled out, and it's never going to happen. We still have to take your land. Uh, and they proceeded. The farmers fought tremendously. A good part of the book talks about how a case starts from real people. Uh, and and they, they, there was no environmental impact statement. Uh, TVA said they didn't need to do one because they were an emergency agency. What was the emergency that TVA was created for? The Great De Depression, which had tapered off a little bit by the 1970s. Uh, right? So, so, I mean, it was just crazy. But in any event, they lost and they lost. Uh, they were talking not only about the fact that the project's supposed benefits were tiny and the costs were huge, not just in terms of intangible, ecological, historical. TPA said the birthplace of Sequoia is literally incalculable in value, and so they valued it as zero. zero right. So, but, but it just in economic terms, the agricultural economy and the farmers said, you look at the real benefits, the real costs, and the alternatives. If you take Highway 72 off, this is the interstate, 75 going north-south, this is 40 east-west. Uh, you take people up Highway 72, each of the round things is either a historic or a recreational spot, and then into the Smokies. The Park Service was so excited. They said, this is a multi-million dollar development for us because we don't have to, uh, we, we don't have to do an entryway. We can have horseback riding, which was destroying the, anyway. Uh, I, I, but of course it was ignored. The alternatives were totally ignored. It was the little dam, it was the, the big dam or nothing. Uh, so, so these people were doing a final census of the river. This is, uh, um, Dave Etnier, who is an internationally known ichthyologist, and he was going along with a mask. You can see it's very broad, but really quite shallow. You can wade and fish the whole river, or could have. This is Buck, the field manager. Uh, this is Wayne Starnes, a PhD. But anyway, he was going, and he reached down with his hands and stood up, and he'd caught this little perch. And he called everybody around and he said, I've never seen this before. I know every perch in the world and I've never seen this. And he walked over to one of the farmers on the side and he said, Bill, this is an endangered species and I think it might save your farm. Um, but they, they sent all this information to the federal government in Washington. There's an endangered species uh, and <laughs> what happened? Right, nothing, uh, nothing at all. Uh, but it turns out, this is the little fish, it turns out that Richard Nixon had signed, this isn't an accurate photograph, but, but you get the feeling. Uh, in 1973, he signed the Endangered Species Act, and it said that no federal agency could jeopardize the continued existence of an endangered species uh, or destroy its critical habitat. One of my students, Hank Hill, was looking for a term paper. I had an exam and a term paper, a very short paper. He came to my office and he said, I was drinking beer with a bunch of fish biology grad students. They found an endangered species in the middle of the Little Tennessee River in the Teleco project area, the Teleco Dam project area. Is that enough for 10 pages? Uh -huh. And I said, yes, it is. <laughs> um, this is the statute. It was written by a bunch of hypocritical environmentalists. Does it say prevention of destructive federal projects? If it did, would it have passed? No way. Interagency cooperation. And you have to take your pencil and underline it to see the two grammatical prohibitions. Number one, you have to ensure that, by the way, misspelled, Congress misspelled, ensure that actions authorized, funded, or carried out, what does that cover? What doesn't that cover? 
right? It's everything. Ensure that do not jeopardize. That was number one of my complaint when I finally filed, or result in the destruction of habitat. Uh, but it had never been litigated up through the courts. Uh, Hank and I called the farmers. We said, you know, you've been meeting on Saturday nights, potlucks to, to, to fight the dam. You've given up, but come one more time. We may still save this river. And I went through the law with the farmers, and they were saying, we just can't do this. TVA is too powerful. And then Hank, my student, uh, Hank Hills, said, do you know what they said in the environmental impact statement? That the history of the valley isn't worth much, or worth zero. That the farmland is not high quality. The farmers started getting furious. There were a couple of, they started getting furious. You need real people. So in the farm, uh, in the fort that night, uh, finally, Asa took off his hat and he said, I've never heard of this fish before, but I say if it can save our farms, we got to try one more time. And he passed the hat around and that money was, was the start. And I said to them, and this is really kind of important if you talk with a lawyer, I said, we have to name the case right. It's versus Tennessee Valley Authority, but who? Who do you want to have bring the case? Who do you want to name? Who do you want the reporters to talk to so they're shocked? Who? Farmers. The farmers, exactly. Teleco farmers versus TVA. But they, because they brought the environmental impact statement case, they said, we can't do it. We can't have two bites at the apple. I am convinced that if I had forced them to name it Teleco farmers versus TVA, the river would still be flowing. So remember the PR, the optics, the media angle of it as well. Uh, but we'll get more into that. Uh, these people are all heroes. Uh, that's uh, the Cherokee uh, leader. These people are fishermen. These are farmers, a couple of students. This is a $15,000 t-shirt. Guess what movie had just come out? Exactly, Jaws. <laughs> and, and so they were selling, and the farmers would drive to Washington, they would lobby, but they didn't give us their name. We would have these big meetings. This is, the river's in the background, and we're up on a, a flatbed, and the ATF has just come and told us we have to clear the field uh, because there's a bomb threat. There's a, a lot of farmers, Indians, students from all over, history people. Uh, and I said to them, you know, there's a bomb threat. Anybody who has to, the only person who left was the Atlanta reporter. Every, we found 12 sticks of dynamites in a bush right in front, but, but there were no detonators. It was just, anyway. Uh, the politics, TVA was saying, these pointy-headed communists are taking away 26,000 jobs from the poor people of East Tennessee, knowing full well that, that it was all hooey. Um, we had to list the species. I was running a fever. Nobody had done this before. I figured, all right, it exists, and I put in a picture of it. Its only known location is there in the Little Tennessee River. I did a map. And, and so, so saying to the federal government, this is an endangered species, I ask you, you have to list it on the endangered species list so that the law can apply. And nothing happened. Uh, these people were tremendously helpful. Uh, this woman is no longer with us, but I dedicated the book to her. Uh, she was one of the best lobbyists. She got me into the old girl network in Washington. Here she is getting me into the White House through her door. She, she was um, a polio in, in a wheelchair. So that door is held together with duct tape. Uh, but these are not high rollers, but very, very savvy. Uh, and, and, and this is a secret person who quite unethically gave me information from time to time as, as I desperately needed it. Uh, we can talk more about that. I couldn't get it listed. Nothing was happening. Nothing was happening because the Iron Triangles were fighting it. In Washington, I was told, if you want to understand politics, if you want to understand how government really works, how many of you have heard of Iron Triangles? It's, it's, it's not taught much in poli sci. They now talk about networks, which is the most wussy way of talking about it. What's an iron triangle? You have industry, you have the economy, which is tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, in technology and whatever, but it creates externalities. Uh, and so we have government, which is supposed to take care of us. Those uh, are the agencies, and, and that's the Congress. But it turns out 
that that triangle is people move around in employment in the triangle, money moves tremendously, media, lobbying. So you don't have just a dam and waterway, you have a timber, oil and gas, mining. All of these iron triangles and the one thing they have in common is they don't like citizens to open up the triangle to transparency, to look at projects and programs that don't make sense. Uh, have I mentioned politics is involved, obviously, in everything you look at. Um, we finally got it listed. I don't have t time to tell you the story, maybe afterwards, but the key was adultery. I found out that a subcommittee chairman was committing adultery, and that was how we got it listed. Uh, so once you have it listed, America is really quite remarkable. No place else in the world could have, I was in Germany, and, and, and uh, the guy said to me, well, you brought this in your own name uh, because we couldn't get the farmers. It's Hank Hill, I put my student first, then Zig Plotter and Donnie Cohen, both of us who had to leave Tennessee. Um, and we filed the complaint, and any person, he said, any person, I said, yes, and you don't even have to be a citizen, against the United States government? I said, yes. But I said, I can bring in the secretary. He said, the minister? I said, yes, I can bring him into court and ask him if he's lying or not. The German said, you Americans, you are all cowboys. Uh, but you see, this is like cowboys. A citizen, can, you file a letter, and if in 60 days the government is not enforcing the law, you come in with the ability to enforce the law, and ultimately you can be paid expert witness and, and attorney's fees for doing the job that the government should be doing. Do, do you see how culturally special that should make us feel? Uh, in any event, I go to court. Uh, this old judge had never decided, well, he decided against TVA once, and, and he said that was a terrible mistake. Uh, he looked at me and said, would you stop this dam for a red-eyed cricket? And I figured this was not going to go well. Um, he was performing way over his IQ. Um, what I wanted to do was talk about the real benefits, the real costs, the real alternatives. And you know the idea of a canary in the coal mine? That an endanger, what's the first thing, what, what's the biggest thing to cause endangerment of a species? Is it shooting or poisoning? No. What is it? It's habitat destruction. And, and so very often, the little endangered species is a sensitive indicator of habitat qualities that are important for a human as well. In the coal mines, methane, you can't smell it, it'll kill you. But if you're carrying a sensitive little creature, when it starts flagging, you run uh, with, with the canary along with you. He wouldn't let me do any of that uh, and, and, and dismiss the case. But it turns out that there were two things that he did. He allowed us to put this lithograph. We were selling this for 16 bucks. Um, this is Exhibit 12 at trial, and we'll mention that again later. Uh, that was put into evidence. Uh, and, and up here, is a still from a video. The guy with all the bushy hair in the river, Wayne, came in and he said, I have an underwater video camera and I saw two little fish spawning. Shall I bring it to court? I said, yes. And we threw it on the wall. And for a minute and a half, he said, right there, this is the male and he's intent on what he's doing. He's taking his left pectoral. Men, listen to this, and over her dorsal fin, and he's wiggling, but she's worried about me, and he goes on and on and on talking about how they're moving around, and then finally, ah, milt and eggs. He said, yeah, they're spawning now, uh, and we let out our breath. Uh, but, but it wasn't just a sex tape. He said, the eggs, when fertilized, go down into the gravel. All right, now, in the background, the grass is going like that. What does that tell you? It's a fast current. Do you see any mud? Do you see any sediment? No, it's a clean, cool, highly oxygenated, shallow river. And he said, if you put a dam, the sediment is going to come and kill the eggs. The fish will be extinct. So the, the judge said, dismissed, this is an absurd case, even if it will jeopardize the continued existence of a species and destroy its habitat. All right? So I was disappointed, but do you see? Were we going to go up on appeal? Absolutely. And if, if, if we won, TVA would take us. 
On appeal, will they take new evidence or do they take the fact finding from the court? They take the fact finding from the court. So we went up to the Sixth Circuit and we said, he found the facts of a violation, he has to enforce the law. Uh, there's the little fish, there's the Exhibit 12. We finally get to the Supreme Court and Justice Powell leans over and asks me, uh, apart from the biological interest, which we don't care anything about, uh, what purpose is served, if any, by, he didn't say that, but, but that's what he, what purpose is served by these little darters? Are they used for food? Are they suitable for bait? Do you, do you see the question? It's human utility. Why do we protect endangered species, a stupid little fish? And of course, they think it's a gigantic hydroelectric dam. Uh, and, and, and he thought he had me. But I sometimes do what I tell my students, which is, all right, guys, graphics. Really important. I had, oh, uh, I wanted to make the canary in the coal mine argument. I had put a stack of that Exhibit 12 at trial with the clerk of the United States Supreme Court. And I said, no, no, Your Honor, you can't use it for food, you can't use it for bait. But as Exhibit 12 at trial would show, it's a special place which has been eliminated everywhere else by what? The fish has been killed everywhere else by what? By, by dams. Uh, and, and at that point, over here where Emily is sitting, the clerk jumps up, he goes down behind the justices, handing them the picture of this little fish, which now, not just a talking head, they're looking at it, and do you see the, the image shows a cool, clear, highly oxygenated, flowing river. Um, in any event, uh, he voted against us. But Berger didn't, he hated our guts, I knew he would. I talked to, to Lee Bollinger, who had clerked uh, for him. I said, he's gonna hate us. Oh yeah, he's gonna hate you. Uh, so we're never gonna get his vote. He said, well, sometimes, if you cite Berger to Berger, you can get Berger. So in the middle of the argument, uh, chapter nine is the, the transcript of the oral argument. But what I put in is what everyone was really thinking. And, and it, it will show you uh, the, the politics of, of the court are ex extraordinary. Even uh, before Justice Scalia got there, Justice Rehnquist had set up the question, Mr. Plotter, you're trying to strip the courts of all of their equitable powers. And I could see Rehnquist mouthing the question. Uh, uh, Berger looked like a Chief Justice. He sounded like a Chief Justice. But he, anyway, Rehnquist had to do his questions for him. Rehnquist was there like this, and I said, oh no, Your Honor, I'm citing Your Honor's, Justice Berger, your opinion in the Rondo case. He said, my case. I said, yes. And he said, you don't need an injunction to stop the project if they're going to voluntarily comply with the law. I said, yes. But if they're not going to comply, then the court must stop it. I said, yes, Your Honor. And, and Rehnquist went apoplectic. Uh, in any event, we don't have to talk much about law, because this is what really happened. The, press went crazy. And of course, stupid little fish, gigantic hydroelectric dam. This is the New York Times article. Drummond Ayers came and stayed with Nellie and Asa. He knew that their farm wasn't being taken for hydroelectric. But he wrote it as if it was a hydroelectric economic boon for the area versus uh, a stupid little fish. Um, and and this is the way it was framed, and this is the way uh, it remained. Um, this is the way the, the dam was pat pictured. Uh, what we asked was, all right, the Supreme Court has said the project must stop, but we knew the politics was going to be trying to kill it off the Supreme Court uh, order. So we said, you know, Congress has to have hearings. Congress has to go and Look at the real economic merits of the dam or the river development without the dam and the tourism into the park. Well, Congress didn't want to do it, but they set up the God Committee, uh, which is, again, an incredible, if any of you is looking for something to write about in political science, this has never existed before. And by the way, this was written by a student of ours from Michigan who never went to law school. She happened to be sitting in the office in Washington and she drafted uh, the, 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 if you ever have a chance, draft the first terms of a document. 
you'll know what's there and what's not there. You'll know its structure. You basically guide what comes out. But she said, the Endangered Species Committee created by these amendments, Secretary of Army, Agriculture, Interior, and Transportation, I forgot to put that, EPA, and NOAA, if by a vote of not less than five of its seven members voting in person, cabinet members themselves had never sat together as a judge-making agency, and they had to do it. The staff worked for three months doing the economic analysis. They presented it to the God Committee, and then there was silence. Uh, this is the God Committee. This is not actually the picture of the God Committee, but, but there they are. Uh, so, so Charles Schultz, I mean, George Schultz says, <laughs> not peanuts. Uh, George Schultz said, well, somebody has to start. This is a project where if you look at the real economics and you do it accurately, here's a project that's 95% complete. And if you take just the cost of finishing it against the total project benefits, it still doesn't pay. Everybody laughed because everybody in Washington knew this was the case. They knew this was corrupt pork barrel. But, but they knew that America didn't know. Um, it turns out, stupid little fish stops dam. Front page above the fold. Times, post, everything. God committee, unanimous decision saying, this was a stupid project from the beginning, is not covered. It doesn't go out to the AP feed for most of the United States. It's just, it's not a good story. It changes the conventional wisdom. These are the people in the Iron Triangle. We had to fight against, look at the power. Here's me, fired, maxing out my visa card and selling t-shirts to, 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 to fight uh, and in any event. The wonder is that we were able to go as far as we could. This is, oh, I didn't show, let's see. Yeah, this is the Secretary of the God Committee. He sent this letter to all the members of Congress, 535 members. He said, you created a special seven-member committee, which I chaired after full consideration, so on and so forth. We found a unanimous verdict that the completion of the dam is not justified. The value of the project doesn't outweigh the value of the river alternatives. But it turns out that the Iron Triangle was working, and the media was not. So. The Congress passed an override uh, late one evening when, when nobody but the pork committee was uh, uh, in attendance. Uh, Jimmy Carter said he would uh, uh, veto it, and then he didn't, although we had the, the votes to uphold him in both houses. Uh, it turns out that, yes, every member of Congress knew, but they knew that America did not know and therefore politics was able to go rolling on, regardless of the merits. We didn't give up. The Cherokee then brought, if, if all the statutes are overridden, and that's what they did with, with that midnight rider, uh, they can't override the Constitution. What part of the river raises religious values for the Cherokee? Did you listen? Remember? The Jerusalem of the Cherokees is going to be destroyed, right? So, and this is Cherokee. We had, uh, and we almost won again in the Sixth Circuit, but didn't. We lost the river. Uh, the bulldozing was completed. The mud was pouring out onto the uh, shoals for the little fish. Um, oh, Asa has died. They come, Nellie was still holding out in her house. Uh, they come and take her out of the house, and they take a bunch of furniture and put it in a moving van, and they dig a hole, and then they push the house into the hole and set it on fire. And she comes by later that night, and she's pointing down. You see, the steam is still coming out. Uh, Asa had made the kitchen table, and the table legs were burning down in the hole. Um, nothing happened for a couple of years. Of course, no city came. TVA was very embarrassed. Finally, they started giving the land away to land development companies, which would build McMansions uh, around the lake. Uh, uh, and, and so we're, we're on Yvonne and, and, and uh, Bill Edwards' farm. Uh, 
And, and so this is the golf course now. And so you finish your golf game, you go down and get into your little boat and you go putt, putt, putt. What are those three things? Silos. TVA knocked down all the barns, all the houses and burned, but they left the silos. So you go around the lake and there are these silos sticking out of the water still. Uh, we had told them that the dam was unsafe. They said, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And then last year they admitted that the dam was unsafe and they put in sand. Do, do you see? The people who live in a place very often know far more the truth of the matter, the reality, the merits. But when you get into the Iron Triangle political system, you need some force to make facts. And, and, and the accidental, hypocritical use of a statute that I know was not intended to stop federal projects was the only way we ever even got a hearing on the economics. All right, the fish has been transferred. There are now about 25,000 of them in two rivers. But the rivers, I did this in, in the, the video. Did you see the video? Yeah. What happens to a river in August? Does the volume go up or down? Down. Temperature, up or down? Up. H oxygen, down. So they've got to put bubblers into those rivers to keep the transplant fish alive. Uh, and you're looking at a quarter of a million dollars worth of bubblers. Uh, the Endangered Species Act is under attack. Uh, it turns out uh, Rand Paul has a bill saying that all endangered species will be removed every five years unless Congress, this wise debating group, you know, uh, affirmatively votes it. It's under attack. Who are the brothers, left and right? Koch brothers. And in the middle, the Koch sniffers. I, I invented that line. I really like it. All right. So, so, all right. So it's a depressing story, but look for the positive. It turns out, in part because everyone thinks this was such a stupid, extreme case, and still the Supreme Court enforced it, the precedent is strong to protect endangered species. And Rehnquist and Scalia tried to cut back, but both of them are now in a different jurisdiction. Uh, so we'll see. But this is also, I think you have to realize uh, the effect of the media. I've talked about that. We can talk more about biology. We can talk about economics. Eminent domain, Kilo in New, New London, they were ripping off the farmers for 330 bucks an acre and then reselling it for 1,000, 125,000 a half acre, right? To, to, anyway. All right, here's the problem. The standard version of government has been that you have the economy, which gives us cell phones and, and, and an incredible quality of life, but we have government to protect us against the excesses, child labor, pollution, you, uh, 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 monopoly or whatever. The trouble is that over time, uh, Chuck mentioned Alaska, our commission said the Exxon Valdez was not an accident. It was bound to happen because a mega system was being run with complacency, collusion at every level of government and neglect. And that happens. The capture phenomenon. People in Congress want to be lobbyists. Be lobbyists go into the agencies. It's back and forth, back and forth. The reality is, whoops, the reality is that dipolar gets tilted by iron triangles. So, so, and, and Asimoglu, when narrow extractive elites, he was talking about the Incas, the Romans, the Asians, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, Chinese, uh, the Mughal Empire, but he was really talking about America. When narrow extractive elites come to dominate a system's economy, its sources of information, its utilization of power, and its cultural expressions, the eventual result is stagnation and entropy. The dipolar system doesn't work. We discovered that in the 1960s uh, when we had Woodstock, good music, uh, three books that changed the way we think of the world. What were they? Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, Feminine Mystique, Betty Friedan, and The Death and Life of Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs. All three books have something in common. Men denied them tenure. <laughs> the, 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 anyway, so, so my, my point is, is this. We have to go beyond the dipolar system, that's Rachel, to a multicentric. 
And what you saw, remember the Germans saying, you are cowboys, you Americans? We now have legal standing in agencies. You don't have to be a lawyer in court. You don't have to be a lawyer to come into the Iron Triangle and enforce the laws if they're not enforcing the laws. And the genius of the 1960s and 70s was not just in the music, but in the involvement of us stopping a stupid war, uh, civil rights, and, and environment, and consumer protection. It's interesting that in the presidential election that's going on right now, there is a battle. And if you look at it, it's to get away. Rehnquist and Scalia hated the idea of citizen enforcement of statutes. The multicentric system got narrower and narrower, and still today, the, the GOP basically does not want the Iron Triangles to be interrupted. And Bernie and Hillary both uh, are, are talking, and we'll see if it's more than talk, about how human pressure should be brought in. But the point is this, this is reality. And that little fish parable, it seems to me, is not just talking about a fish, and not just talking about one beautiful place, but the fact that you are doomed for the rest of your lives to understand that you cannot escape from the politics, from the economics, from the yab 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 of the media that can overrun things that you know are right uh, and beautiful. Uh, and there's now law. And some of us are trying to produce lawyers uh, who, who know how to do public interest. Uh, what's this? Yeah, ultimately, the answer is not inside that building. Uh, if you've ever listened to what's going on in there, you know, it's outside that building. This is Earth Day. But there's been a tremendous effort by the Iron Triangles to marginalize environmentalism. I went on Google Images, environmentalist. This was a year and a half ago. And this is what I got, tree huggers. And this guy, I mean, he looks really nice. But, but in Earth Day, you had everybody. Environmentalists get marginalized by stories like the stupid little snake. I went on Nexus. And I found a bunch of articles. I won't read them. Now. But one of them is in Ammo Magazine, teaching women to fight so that they can defend the people against government and its stupid snail darters. All right. In any event, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring this but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or both. The people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. I mean, do you see? First law of ecology, as Max says, everything's related to everything else. Scratch away at almost any environmental controversy, and pretty soon you're going to see yourself looking at some very important issues of democracy. Uh, there's a book that you can look at, and Emily will sell it to you if you want, but it's also in the library. Um, but I have to tell you, I, I think I did this on the TED Talk, right? The, I have to warn you, according to a number of self-informed observers, this book was written by a known homosocialist. <laughs> that, that's a good ending line, right? I think that's, that's yeah. All right. So um, thank you. <laughs>